Kubernetes architecture can be broken down into two parts, the control plane components, which include the controller manager, API server, etc. and scheduler, and the node components, which include kubelet, the queue proxy, and container runtime. The control plane components provide the core Kubernetes services and orchestration of the application workloads, while the actual application workload run on the node components. In Azure Kubernetes service, control plane is automatically created, configured, and managed by Azure. There are four main services running in the control plane. Cube API server is how the underlying Kubernetes APIs are exposed. This component provides the interaction for management tools such as kubectl. Etc is used to maintain the state of your Kubernetes cluster and its configuration. This highly available service is a key value store within Kubernetes. Cube Controller Manager oversees a number of smaller controllers that perform actions such as replicating pods and handling node operations. When you create or scale applications, the Cube Scheduler determines what nodes can run the workloads and starts them there. On the agent node component side, we have kubelet, which is a Kubernetes agent that processes the orchestration request from the control plane and schedule the requested containers. Virtual networking is handled by Kube proxy on each node. The proxy routes network traffic and manages IP addresses for services and pods. The container runtime is the component that allows containerized applications to run and interact with additional resources such as virtual network and storage. Now that you know some of the components and their high-level functionality, let us see how these components talk to each other when you issue a command to create a new Kubernetes deployment. Do not worry if this ends up looking very complicated. You do not need to remember all of this. Just remember there are multiple subcomponents with very well-defined function for each of them. In step one, kubectl gives a pod deployment manifest to the API server. The API server then creates a deployment resource and that info is saved in etset. Deployment controller watches for any new deployment resources and creates the replica set resource. Then replica set controller watches for any new replica set resources. Replica set controller creates the pod resource based on how many replicas set and actual pods are present. In steps six and seven, Cube Scheduler watches for unbound pod resources and schedules them on a target node. Then Kubelet calls container runtime interface and container network interface to create a pod and container with networking configured. In steps nine and 10, CRI calls host compute layer also called HCS to create container and host networking service called HNS to create the endpoint. Finally, in steps 11 and 12, QProxy watches for any new endpoint and programs HNS with load balancer and access control list. Now that we have covered some of the Kubernetes fundamentals, let's start deploying a cluster in Azure. In this demo, I will show you how to deploy AKS cluster using Azure portal. You can follow along if you have a subscription handy or take the labs that follow. On the Azure portal, I will click on create a resource and then select containers category on the left. As you can see, there are quite a few services under containers category that Microsoft offers apart from many more from marketplace offerings. Now under Azure Kubernetes service, I will click create. Since this is a brand new subscription, I will create a new resource group. I will name it rg1-codecloud-aks. The name here does not really matter. It just has to be unique in this subscription. If you have a naming convention that you want to follow, please do. Next, I will name our Kubernetes cluster as aks1-codecloud-app. This name has to be unique in this resource group. I will then change the region to Southeast Asia, that is Singapore. Since this is not a business critical app and because I want to save some money, I will uncheck all availability zones. When you select more than one AZ, Azure will spread the nodes in the node pool across availability zones, providing higher availability. 
you should of course do this in your production environment. One thing to note on AZs is that not all regions has availability zones. For example, if I were to select Australia Southeast, there are no AZs to select. Alright, let's go back to Australia Southeast and uncheck all availability zones. I will leave the default version of AKS, which as you can see is the mid version in the list. The Kubernetes community releases minor versions roughly every three months. AKS follows 12 months of support for a general availability Kubernetes version. So version 1.24, which went GA in July 2022, will be supported for one year from that date. Microsoft does provide a pathway to upgrade deployed AKS clusters. I will leave the default node size to DS2v2. In module 2, I talked about various VM sizes available in Azure. This one has two vCPUs and 7 gig of memory. Let's set the node count to 1. This will give me an opportunity to show you how to scale it up later. Click Next. Since we have set the node count to 1, node pools show that as the maximum. That is, minimum is set to 1 and maximum is also set to 1. If I were to go back and change the max to 5 and click Next, you will see that reflected here. Also note that the max spots per node is set to 110. If you need to add more than 110 pods, you will need to add more nodes. This, by the way, has nothing to do with VM size. You can select a VM with 32 core CPU and 128 gig of memory, but the pod to node ratio is between 30 to 250, which can be configured if you click on the agent pool. Let's set this to 30 and click update and then next. In the authentication and authorization blade, you have three options to select from. We will leave the default here and move to the next screen. I will discuss this option in some detail in the next module. In the networking option, select Azure CNI. Since I do not have any existing virtual networks, I will let Azure create one for me. Do not worry about what these options mean. The network configuration and network policy are important settings and I will discuss them in the next module. For now, let's click Next. We will take this opportunity to create an Azure Container Registry. Container Registry is a managed service that is based on open source Docker Registry. This can help you store our container images like the one we created in the previous module securely and privately. I will give it a name, use the same resource group and region. I will choose a basic SKU. SKUs in Container Registry is about higher performance and ability to replicate across the globe. Since we do not need all the jazz, let's select basic and click OK. Let's enable container logs and let the logs go to this new log analytics workspace that Azure is creating for us. And yes, we will come back to monitoring later. Click next to go to advanced plate. The infrastructure resource group is where all the infra related to AKS like networks, VMs, etc. are created. Microsoft recommends to leave the defaults, but in your production environments, you can change it if the naming policies require you to. We will click next and leave the tags blank for now. If you have used any cloud platform before, you know what tags are. If not, you can ignore these for now. In the next screen, Azure runs a quick validation to see if all the required options are filled and if we can continue with the deployment. Once the validation is complete, let's click Create. In the last demo, we had deployed an AKS cluster along with some prerequisites like resource group, virtual network, etc. In this demo, we will connect to that cluster via CLI and deploy an application to that cluster. There are a few ways to connect to our AKS cluster via CLI. You can use the Azure Cloud Shell to do that without the need to deploy anything on your computer. All the dependencies like kubectl, Azure CLI, and Azure PowerShell modules are pre-installed in that. You can also use PowerShell on Windows or Terminal on your Mac or Linux machines to connect to Azure. I will use PowerShell on my Windows machine to connect. The process is exactly the same if you're using your Mac. The only reason I'm not using Cloud CLI is that in some demos, 
I will need more than one terminal window running. I have logged on to Azure CLI via AZ login command. To connect to our AKS cluster, I will need to get the cluster credentials. Before we do that, let me run the AZ account show to show the subscription we are connected to. This is important to validate if you have more than one subscription in your tenancy. Now, most CLI commands require you to pass the resource group parameter and I am lazy. So I will set the default to our AKS resource group by typing AZ configure dash dash default group and set it to the resource group we created previously. Now I will run AZ AKS get credentials command along with the AKS cluster name. This will download the credentials and merge it into our current user context. Now that we are connected to our AKS cluster with correct credentials, let's validate if kubectl can access the cluster. Running kubectl config current dash context will display the current context that is the AKS cluster we are connected to. So far, so good. Now, we will run some common kubectl commands. Do not worry if you do not know all of these commands. As you start to use these commands, you will know what they do and what parameters they require. Running kubectl get nodes will show all the nodes that our cluster have. If you remember, we had set the minimum and maximum to one node, and that is what is showing here. If you open the Azure portal, this is the same name of a virtual machine scale set computer name. The other common kubectl command is to get deployments, where kubectl get deployments, and kubectl get pods to show the pods running. At the moment, we do not have any deployments or pods. Let's fix that by deploying the app we created in the previous module. I had uploaded the Docker image from our previous module to Docker Hub. So let's pull this image and deploy it to our AKS cluster. To do that, we will run kubectl create deployment command along with the deployment name, which is code cloud app and image switch to my Docker Hub repository. At the end of the image name, make sure you add the v1. We have more than one version in my Docker Hub repository. Let's also set the replicas as one. And just like that, our deployment is completed. Last time when we ran kubectl get deployments, we had none. Let's check if that has changed. As expected, we can see a new deployment. kubectl get pods will show us the running pod. We can, of course, see the same pod visually on the Azure portal too. Now that we have a successful deployment, let's connect to it. In order to do that from outside, we need to create another Kubernetes construct called the service. Creating a load balancer service type with AKS will route traffic through an Azure load balancer. The Azure load balancer will round robin the traffic downstream to the pods that sit behind the service. AKS load balancer service types can be created using either an external or internal Azure load balancer, external being the default option. And that is exactly what we need. In order to create a service, we will run the kubectl expose command. So kubectl expose deployment, we will put on our app name, type as load balancer and map port 80 from our load balancer to port 80 on our port. Now that this deployment is complete, let's get the public IP of the service by running kubectl get service command. We can simply open the URL by typing the public IP on a browser and there you can see our awesome website hosted on AKS and we are open for business.